spray convertible. Yes, ma'am. Turn off your motor, please. Come on. Close that door. What do you want? Come on, we'll talk inside. I'm the star detective. Well, I haven't time. Won't take long. Open your bag. But I don't understand. Open it, please. I'm going home. I don't want to be talked to like that. All right, if you want it this way. Harry. Yes, Mr. Hogan? I just want you to witness this. See this pin? Yes, Mr. Hogan. Okay. Do you have a sales slip for that pin, madam? If you have, I'll take a look at it. Come on, come on, we're wasting time. You'll have a crowd here in a minute. Probably just faking. Yes, they usually pull a faint when they're caught, especially the fancy looking ones. All right, lady. You're awake now. Let's have your name. No. I can't tell you my name. We've got the goods on you. You can't wiggle your way out of this. The sales girl here saw you do your shoplifting. I certainly did. The mermaid pin was $300. And she said she wanted something more expensive. So I turned partly to the showcase, and, and I could clearly see your reflection in the glass as she The pin was removed from your purse by Mr. Hogan here. Now, you can either give me your name and come clean with a statement, or you can save it all to tell to the police. The police? If you know what's good for you, you'll talk now. You mustn't speak, Mrs. Sutton. You're still dizzy and too weak to remember. Hey, wait a minute. What is this guy, a lawyer? Mr. Sims knows who I am. Why, yes, but I'm busy, Mr. Corvo. If this woman is a friend of yours, the She's best no thing... She's a friend of mine. It's you I'm concerned about, Mr. Sims, and your wife, who is a client and a very dear friend of mine. I don't think she'd like all the trouble you're making for yourself. Why, you don't have to worry about me, Mr. Corvo. I'm in no trouble, I assure you. Not yet, but you're starting one of the biggest publicity messes any store ever got into. This woman whom you're badgering is Mrs. William Sutton, the wife of the distinguished psychoanalyst. Treating her like a common thief will bring more discredit on you and your store than on her. Miss Wilson, will you see if Mrs. William Sutton has an account with us? Yes, Mr. Simpson. I'm sure she has. You know, your job as manager is to protect your clients as well as your store from scandal. I don't need any advice about my job, Mr. Corvo. You'll think a little differently when you see your name splashed across the front pages as the man who hounded a proud, sick woman into a nervous breakdown. Oh, she's sick now. You know she is. You've had experience. A woman as wealthy and civilized as Mrs. Sutton isn't a thief. But the pin was in her purse. It wasn't the thief who put it there. I see. You mean she's suffering from kleptomania. Doctor and Mrs. William Sutton have had a charge account with us for five years. I see. Yes, I see. And what you see is that Mrs. Sutton is wealthy enough to buy a dozen such pins. Oh, now, look, Mr. Corvo, I don't want any trouble. Exactly it just what happens. I However, we'll have to make a record of this matter and keep it on file even if we don't report it to the authorities. Thank you very much, Mr. Sims. Oh, and I suggest that you add the cost of the pin to Mrs. Sutton's bill, which will solve the immediate problem to everybody's advantage. It's now legally yours, Mrs. Sutton. You have bought it, paid for it, and are free to wear it without agitating the police. Is there someone with my husband, Miss Hall? Yes, there is, Mrs. I Sutton. want to see him. I can't wait. I must see him now. Please tell him. I have orders never to disturb him. I know, I know, I know, Miss Hall, I know. Of course, if you're ill, Mrs. Take Sutton, or there's something... Let's give it to him. I'll wait upstairs.
Are you all right? Hello, darling. What's wrong, dear? Nothing, darling. Thanks. Nothing. You look terribly handsome in the middle of the day before all your chattering patients have worn you out. Miss Hall told me you came in very disturbed. She said you insisted violently oh, that I... Oh, that's so silly, violently. Darling, I just stopped to ask her if you were busy. I wondered if you wanted to go to the concert tonight. It's Heifetz. You haven't heard any real music for such a long time. I thought it might relax you. Hall must be losing her grip on reality. I guess she's so used to my poor patience that everything sounds like hysteria to her. I'd like to skip the concert if you don't mind too much. I want to do some writing tonight. Of course not, darling. Thanks. And I'm terribly sorry you had to leave a patient like this for no reason. It's no harm done. He won't miss me. It's that young veteran I told you about. The one who won't talk? Mm-hmm. After two weeks, he still comes in every day. Sits down, can't talk. But why does he come to you? If he won't let you help him. Oh, he will eventually. It's just that it's difficult to begin unloading fears and secrets and guilts. Poor fellow, the war was an easier conflict than the one he's in now. Oh, Bill. Struggling all day with those sick people and their wretched complexes. How you must hate them. I don't hate them, darling. I'm trying to help them. They're my job. They no, need me. No, your job is using your brain and finishing your book. You said so yourself. They interfere. Stop worrying about me as a frustrated genius. I'm not. I'm a busy doctor and a happy husband, an enviable combination. I wouldn't trade it for a dozen books. Oh, Bill, you're wonderful. You've always been so very wonderful to me. I just wish that... Wish what? That I could help you. If I were only brighter and, and you could talk to me about your scientific problems. Just stay as you are. As you've always been, healthy and adorable. Dr. Sutton's residence. Who is it? Who's calling, please? Just a minute. Mr. David Corvo. Oh, tell him I haven't time to. Oh, never mind. You can clean up later. Hello, Mr. Corvo. I'm sorry, but I can't. I'm busy today. Mr. Corvo, it's utterly impossible. I have a luncheon engagement. But why should I see you? I quite understand. Of course, if you insist. Yes. Yes, I'll be there. One o'clock. wise not to tell your husband, Mrs. Sutton. A successful marriage is usually based on what a husband and wife don't know about each other. Too frightened to eat, Mrs. Sutton? I'm not hungry. I see. Waiting for the wretched blackmailer to remove his mask and begin his blackmailing. What do you want? You mean, how much? Yes. Well, I saved you from an ugly scandal, one that could ruin your distinguished husband's career. What an advertisement for a renowned psychoanalyst married unaware to a kleptomaniac. And you are willing to pay me to keep this whimsical fact out of the newspapers? Yes. Now? Yes, now. Well, I can see that I was never cut out to be a villain. I dislike inspiring so much terror in such a lovely woman. Please don't talk to me. Yes, I forgot you. You're buying my silence. Five thousand dollars. Dear me, that's quite a sum, considering that it's tax-free. I take it you don't intend to report this either to Uncle Sam or to your husband. Very few wives are in so fortunate a position with a bank account of their own. Obviously a large one. That's all I'll pay. That's quite enough. Isn't it? You're rather disillusioning, Mrs. Sutton, for the wife of so brilliant a man as Dr. Sutton. First of all, for your stupidity in assuming that you can get rid of a blackmailer by giving him money. Secondly, and worse, by identifying me as a nasty crook. Here's your check, Mrs. Sutton. 
You disturbed my vanity rather deeply. I always fancied I had a fine, upright look and that an honest heart shone out of my not-too-splendid face. <laughs> oh, I'm joking, Mrs. Sutton. Please, Vincent here is an old friend. I wouldn't want him to think that I was an ogre that makes beautiful women cry into their soup. That's better. Thank you. And now, may I tell you why I insisted on meeting you? I had something to give you that I was sure would make you feel better about yesterday. I persuaded uh, the manager, Mr. Sims, to give me the Mrs. William Sutton shoplifting report from the store files. Here it is. If you will tear it up, there will no longer be a record of yesterday's episode on file anywhere. I, I feel like such a fool. How can I ever thank you? Uh, do you know Tina Cosgrove? Not very well. I've been to some of her parties. Well, she's giving one for me Tuesday afternoon. For you? Then you must be a celebrity. In Tina's eyes, anybody who attends three of her parties automatically becomes a celebrity. I made the grade last month. Tina, darling. What a wonderful party. Everybody's here. I adore people famous enough to know me. Oh, no. How magnificent, Tina. Whatever you are, you always attract the best society. Oh, don't be silly, dear. I don't have to attract society. I manufacture it. <laughs> Come, I want you to meet my guest of honor. Yeah, of course. Well. David, this is Ferruccio, 31st Baron of Ravello. I do. And his adorable fiancée, Taffy Lou. I'm responsible for bringing them together. You're in the movies, Mr. Corvo. No. Mr. Corvo reads souls, guides human destinies with the aid of the stars and makes fortunes for other people at a nominal fee. How wonderful. I have always admired fortune tellers, Mr. Cordova. I am not quite a fortune teller. He's a genius. Before you go, you must attend one of his lectures on hypnotism. Uh, nor am I quite a hypnotist. I use a number of sciences in my experiments with the human family. For instance, you, Baron, are obviously born in November. Late November. Yes, Sagittarius. But how do you know that? You are also a hyperthyroidic type, plus a thalamus over-functioning. And I would say from the droop of your eyelids and the overstressed tone of your speech, with a manic depressive tendency. Adding up these various informations, we get a man of violent temper, suffering from fits of melancholia, who within the past year has been preoccupied with the thought of committing suicide. But how can you know? I have spoken it to nobody except my Taffy Lou. And how the stars tell you that? Not the stars, my eyes. They too are a science. The cut is only recently healed. A bad one. But this man is marvelous. You mustn't move a step from now on without consulting him. I'll arrange everything. I'll bring him to Italy for your wedding. All it will cost you is expenses for David and me in Rome. It will be a pleasure. <laughs> Darling, you make it sound like a pair of pickpockets, which is unfair to one of us. Could I get you a drink, Anne? Yes, please. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. I hope that your new marriage will give you something to live for, if only a divorce. Oh. A pure canasta, boy. Now, this will help your headache. Does it show? Not much. A little squint in your eyes. How could you tell the Baron was born in November? Uh, Taffy Lou is my protege. I interviewed her just an hour before I came to the party. Very ingenious. I'm so glad you're here. You make Tina's party seem an almost human event. You're wonderfully remote from this sort of people. I want to help you, Anne. Your eyes are full of fear and tension. Have you slept? No. Not since that day? I can't sleep. Pills any help? They're no good. They don't put me to sleep. They just make me jump inside. Yes, I'll have to ask Bill for some other kind. Don't. Your husband is not entirely a stupid man. If he finds out you have insomnia, he'll start looking for its cause and probably stumble on it. We don't want to disillusion him and appear like all the other twisted little customers on his analyst's couch. If I could only sleep. You need treatment. And you can't go to a doctor. Your husband would hear it at the first psychoanalytical Catholic class he attended. So perhaps you will swallow your prejudice against a humble astrologer whose only medical diploma is the gratitude of his patients. Thank you. But I can't possibly become a patient of yours. You are already. The fact that I know of your kleptomania the fact that I know that your mind is sick and threatening to get out of hand gives me a medical position in your life, doesn't it? Yes, I, I suppose it does. You're relaxed with me. You don't have to exhaust yourself trying to seem normal. The serene and devoted wife who doesn't dare upset her busy husband. 
Your soul can undress in front of me. That means that your cure is already beginning. I can make you sleep every night. Nine hours of peaceful, happy sleep. How? Trust me. Look at me. There are no thoughts in your mind, no fears. Trust me. I can help you. Don't think of anything. Forget. There is nothing to remember. Just close your eyes and forget. Can you hear me, Anne? Yes. You can hear only my voice. All of the sounds have faded away. You will hear only my voice until I wake you up. Yes. You must do what I say. Do you know that? Yes. Go to the window. Draw the curtains. Go to the door. Close the door. Then come back and sit down. Now. Open your eyes. Give me your hand, Anne. Put your hand in mine, Anne. Hold my hand. I'm going to leave an order in your mind that you will obey later. Yes. Tonight at 11 o'clock, you will go to sleep. I will go to sleep. You will fall asleep at 11 o'clock tonight, and you will sleep for nine hours. I will sleep for nine hours. You will remember nothing that has happened here. Nothing. You will wake up slowly and pleasantly. Wake up now. for a moment. Feel better? Oh, yes. Much. I really feel so rested. And you will sleep tonight without any trouble. What if I do? Sorry. Oh, Terry, come in. Well, who was that? The woman who no longer admires me as much as she used to. Her name is Teresa Randolph. At 3 o'clock tomorrow, Anne. What about 3 o'clock tomorrow? I'll expect you then at my apartment. Your apartment? <laughs> you give that simple word a wealth of sinister meaning that almost brings the Victorian era back into existence. I work at my hotel. 
I find it more convenient and less expensive. I'm sorry. Three o'clock tomorrow. Yes, I'll be there. Good. Look, the 31st Baron of Ravallo looks as if he may escape with all his palaces here absent. You better do something about it. I'm delighted to have brought back a little of your wit, even at my expense. Ma parola perché andate via quando subito? Rimane tomorrow. Voi vi prego. In the meantime, I'll be there. Exit mio invitato favorito, bravo. How do you like that? He speaks Italian too. Excuse me. Four girls simply out of Dear, I'm out of powder. Care to use mine, Mrs. Sutton? Thank you. It's a bit dark. I like that shade. Yes, it keeps one from looking like a corpse in the sunlight. <laughs> I'm Teresa Randolph. How do you do? I owe your husband a great deal. He's a very brilliant and honest man. Yes, he is all of that. Have you known David Corvo long, Mrs. Sutton? Not very. I have. Of course, it's none of my business, my dear. I belong to no wives' protective association. What do you mean? I mean only to be helpful. I'd like to warn you about David. Warn me? Aren't you being rather presumptuous, Mrs. Randolph? You have no reason to be jealous of me. I'm old enough to be your mother. Jealous? He's after your money, Mrs. Sutton. And he'll get it. He'll keep after you till he has what he wants. He never stops. He's lived off women all of his life. That's contemptible. I won't listen to you. I forbid you ever to talk to me like this about David Corvo. I warn you, I'll stand for it. Girls, girls battling over dear David in my bedroom. It's the most dramatic thing that ever happened in it. Three days and three nights without you. You know, that's a great sacrifice to make for psychiatry. Would you like me to go along, Bill? I love San Francisco. Oh, I'll bore you to death. Afternoon and evening sessions. I wouldn't go myself if I weren't slated for one of the main discussions. Of course you must go. I'll be lonely. Very proud of you. Oh, Donnie, I'm all greasy. A minor handicap. Did you have a good time at the Cosgrove party this afternoon? Yes, very nice. No, I'm glad. Who was there? Oh, the usual people. You know, the greatest kick I get when we go to a party together is when people stare at you and say, who is that lovely girl? Why, that's Dr. Sutton's wife. She's very devoted to her. My head swells up like a balloon. Thanks, darling. Oh, I'm terribly sleepy. What time is it? Just 11. Sorry, but I... I've got to sleep. I'll put out the light in just a minute. Well, my sleeping beauty. Take off your robe and slippers. Hey. Hello, Daisy. I'm expecting a visitor, Mrs. Sutton. Will you tell the desk to send her right up? And don't put through any calls until I let you know. Thank you. Daisy, I told you I didn't want to be disturbed. Palm Springs. All right, put it through. Oh, Terry, I was wondering who could be on Palm Springs on a Wednesday. No, I told you I'd have the money for you by the first. You're not going to get a chance to exercise your new martyr complex and ruin both of us. You're going to pay every dollar you owe to your loving daughter and live on as an honest woman. My dear old ex-adored, I don't think it's any of your stupid business just where I get the money or how. It's granted I'm an oily rascal. 
Yes, I agree. A liar, a swindler, and what was that last one? Ah, oh, yes, without a trace of human conscience. Very good. You're in top form today, Terry. Almost makes me lonesome for your faded charms. No, I won't have it for you tomorrow. I told you it would take at least another week. Oh, and watch yourself, my dear. Mars and the minor planets are entering your seventh house until the 21st. That may mean serious trouble for you unless you're very careful. Have fun. Is Mr. Corvo in? Mr. Sutton? Yes. Please go right up. Apartment 9B. Where's the house telephone? Right over there, but Mr. Corvo is expecting you. Thank you. Apartment 9B, please. Oh, my dear Anne, where are you? Well, you're very prompt. That's always a virtue in a patient. Please come up, 9B. What? Well, my dear Anne, you're being utterly absurd. I always see my patients in my apartment. Well, it's my office. Very well, I... I bow to your abysmal scruples. I say that your conduct is a bit disturbing to a man of integrity. I'm sorry to disturb you. I do not surround my work with the impressive gadgets favored by your husband and his fellow professors, such as downy couches and recording machines. But my professional ethics, unorthodox as they may be, do not include practicing medicine in a lobby. Isn't there a bar or grill open? <laughs> Forgive me for my lack of understanding. It's not me you're afraid of, but yourself. Relax. Let's go in here and you'll be safe. From any unwifely impulses. You're a bit smug. And rather stupid, Mr. Corvo. Indignation in a patient is always a sign of progress. However, as your doctor, may I call attention to the logic of your behavior? How much better to sit unnoticed in my apartment than to squat here and be seen by everybody holding an alcoholic rendezvous with a man? You make me feel very young. I haven't heard that seductive line since my college days. Were they happy days? Yes. Happier than now? I know you, Anne, better than you know yourself. You're unhappy. You're miserable. You've locked yourself away in a characterization, the serene and devoted wife. That play acting is destroying you. You know, you make me ashamed to be here. Why? Because I should have gone to my husband, not to you. Your husband can't cure you, Anne. He's the one who made you sick. That's nonsense. You mustn't be afraid of what you want. It's better than stealing, better than exploding with neuroses. You misunderstand me. I'm not looking for a love affair. Vincent, afraid of being plied with liquor? I'll have a martini. Uh, two martinis, Vincent. Yes, Mr. Corvo. Did you sleep last night? Yes, nine hours. I woke up this morning absolutely a new woman as if there were nothing wrong with me. I should think that would inspire a little trust toward your doctor. May I be frank? Please. I heard things about you yesterday which may or may not be true. From Mrs. Randolph, a former patient of mine who has transferred her hallucinations to your husband's office. Hardly a sound source of information. Possibly not. But I'm grown up enough to know your technique. You have a talent for making a woman feel close and dependent on you. I can release you from a torture chamber called Mrs. William Sutton. I'm afraid you're wasting your time. Sit down, please. I understand you completely. You adore your husband and you want me in your life only as a man who can put you to sleep rather than wake you up. Yes, and I'll pay you. Fifty dollars for each treatment. And I'll come every day. Where do you want your treatments? Here in a bar room? Why not? Terry Randolph can be quite a nuisance. Will you give me her address? I feel awful about the way I talk to her. I think I should write her a note. Call her up right now. Tell her you've taken her warnings to heart and you intend to use me only as a doctor at a distance of four paces. <laughs> What's her telephone number? The switchboard girl will get her for you. Thanks. Daisy? Please, will you get me Mrs. Teresa Randolph on the phone?
Vincent. Vincent. A small accident. Clean that up quickly and bring yes, us two sure. more martinis, will you? Right away. Uh, hurry it up, will you, Vincent? Yes, sir. Mrs. Randolph doesn't answer. Shall I try again later? Yes, please. I'll be in the bar with Mr. Corpo. Well? She wasn't home. Oh, too bad. Uh, finish your drink. Relax, and we'll begin our treatment.
Give me that. Dead? Yeah. Turn off the burglar alarm. I'll call the police. Operator. Police department, please. statement, Mr. Sutton. If there's anything you don't agree with, please mention it. Formal statement given by Ann Sutton, resident of Westwood, California. Witnessed by Lieutenant James Colton, Sergeant Robert Jeffries, and Dr. Peter DeVal, psychiatrist, the Los Angeles Police Station, City Hall, 11.20 p.m., June 3rd, 1949. Question. What is your name, please? Answer, Mrs. William Sutton. Question. Where do you live? Answer, 725 Willow Drive. Question. What time did you leave your house this evening? Answer, I don't remember. Question. Now, will you tell us why you went to Mrs. Teresa Randolph's house? Answer, I don't know. Now, Mrs. Sutton, will you please tell us how did you get into the house? That is the home of Mrs. Randolph. Answer, I don't remember. Question. You know that Mrs. Randolph was strangled to death between the hours of 9 and 10 o'clock tonight. Answer, yes, I know. Do you admit, Mrs. Sutton, that the scarf found around Mrs. Randolph's neck, now displayed before you, is yours? Answer, yes, it is my scarf. Question. This pin with a clasp broken was found on the floor near the murdered body. Did you drop it while you were strangling Teresa Randolph? Answer, I don't know. Question. Had you any reason for hating Mrs. Randolph? Answer, yes. That's not true. I didn't hate her. But you said you did. I heard you. I couldn't have. I don't remember going there, I tell you. I couldn't have done it. I couldn't. Unless... Unless I'm crazy. Unless I'm crazy. wish I can remove that remark about hating Mrs. Randolph from your statement. Doesn't matter. I'm all so mad. I'll continue reading that. Question. Did you go to Mrs. Randolph's house for the purpose of killing her? Answer, I don't remember going there. Hello? San Francisco. Dr. William Sutton. I'm sorry, I, I can't hear you. Would you mind repeating? Yes, Mrs. Randolph's a patient of mine. What? You can make the two o'clock plain, Doctor. I'd appreciate it if you'd come right to my office at City Hall. He'll be here pretty soon. You didn't have to tell him like that over the telephone. He'll think... What'll he think, Mrs. Sutton? That I did it. That I killed her. You wish to state now that you didn't, Mrs. Sutton? I don't know. I don't know what happened. I can't remember anything. I'm dreaming all this. <laughs> what do you say, Doc? Can she follow? Yes, I think so. Shock is wearing off. There's just a little more, Mr. Sutton. Question, is there anything more you wish to add to this statement, Mrs. Sutton? Answer, no. Question, you admit that this statement was given by you of your own free will, voluntarily. No promise of immunity or threats of violence were used on you. And after it's reduced to writing, you're ready to sign it. Answer, I'll sign it. Finished 11.43 p.m. Here you are, Miss Sutton. Bottom of the page, please.
Thank you. All right, Bob. Let's go. I don't care what she signed. She's not guilty of murder. I put it in the open, Doctor, because I'd like to ask you some questions that might clear things up for both of us. Did your wife ever talk to you about David Corvo? What's David Corvo got to do with her? Dr. Sutton, I know this is tough for you. But you're entitled to know all the facts. Your wife was tied up with David Corvo kind of intimately. Ridiculous. I don't believe it. I refuse to listen to that kind of talk about my wife. I'd listen if I were you. It's part of the case against her. You can't tell me my wife and Sorry, David... Sorry, Doctor, to rub it in, but we have witnesses to their relation. The staff at Corvo's Hotel. can't be true. It must be part of some fantastic plot against Dan. Last week, your wife denounced Mrs. Randolph in a fit of jealousy for coming between her and Corvo. It happened at a party. Your wife paid daily visits to Corvo's hotel for a week before the murder. She sat drinking with him in the bar room. She quarreled with him there one day, broke a glass, then rushed out to telephone Mrs. Randolph. You have witnesses for that? Yes. When can I talk to my wife? Now, if you want to. She's waiting in Dr. Duval's office. Get her, will you, Bob? You understand? It'll have to be in front of me. If I could have ten minutes alone with her. Sorry, police regulations. But we'll stay out of your way. We're not trying to throw any curves in this case, Doctor. Isn't necessary. Please, don't cry. I won't. Sit down, man. I think I ought to explain, Doctor, that anything your wife says and answer to your questions may be used against her. We understand. Bill, there's something wrong with me. Help me, please. I'm going to help you with everything I've got, regardless of any other circumstances. What other circumstances? You'll tell me the truth, Anne, will you? Of course, darling. I want to hear about David Corvo. Why, I, I met him just a few times. Go on. That's all, Bill. He hasn't got anything to do with this. He has. How? You've been to his hotel. No. You were seen there with him time and again, drinking. Yes, that's right. I met him in the bar. I meant I never went to his apartment. You fought with Mrs. Randolph at a party because you were jealous of her. Jealous? How can you think that? Do you love a man? Oh, no, no, Bill. It's nothing like that. And forget that I'm your husband. That doesn't matter now. We'll talk about that side of it later when you're out of your present danger. The truth is you've been seeing Corvo for weeks at his hotel. He was helping me. Because I was sick. And you went to a quack like Corvo for doctoring? Yes. You were sick. What was the matter with you?
man. How did it start? How did you meet him? You wanted to tell me? Tell me. I'm mixed up, Bill. What are you asking me? How did you meet David Corvo? You won't believe me. No matter what I tell you. You don't want to hear the truth. You won't let me tell it. You think I'm lying. You are. Oh, no, Bill. Does this cheap parasite mean this much to you? Did you willing to wreck nothing. everything to cover up for him? Cover up for him? How? You saw him there. You saw him kill her. You're trying to protect him. Oh, no, no, Bill. I didn't see him. You don't believe me. I'm afraid it's pretty obvious, Doctor. She was lying. Yes, she seemed to be lying. About David Corvo. We've been married quite a while. It was a very nice marriage. I only mention it because I want you to understand why she had to lie to me. It's very hard telling that kind of truth to a husband who's trusted you. I see. You charging her with murder, Lieutenant? Yes. Tell your lawyer. She didn't do it. She's protecting Corvo. He killed Mrs. Randolph. You see, I was Mrs. Randolph's doctor. Corvo made love to her and swindled her out of $60,000. The money was an inheritance and belonged to a daughter who was coming of age this month. Mrs. Randolph told you all this? Yes, in the course of her analysis. You can hear the recordings yourself if you come down with me to my office. Lieutenant Colton. Yes? Who'd you ask? Get a hold of the manager. Maybe he'll know where he is. That was a report on Corvo. He's not at his hotel. You let him get away. He escaped. Take it easy, doctor. If you have any facts, I'll be glad to hear them. But he's gotten away, I tell you. Facts, Doctor. You say that Corvo and Mrs. Randolph together stole $60,000 of her daughter's money. Yes. I advise Mrs. Randolph to tell her daughter the truth. And to take David Corvo into court and face the whole rotten mess is the only way she could keep her health. She agreed. She saw Corvo and gave him a week to return the money before taking action. He beat her up and threatened to kill her. But she was determined to go through with it. She was going to notify her daughter and a lawyer on Monday. Corvo killed her to keep from going to jail as a swindler. Hold it a minute. Sounds pretty solid to me. Lieutenant Colton. You have, eh? Where is he? What? Okay, get over there. I'll be right with you. Found Corvo. You can come along if you want to. In here, Lieutenant. Lieutenant Colton, homicide. I'm Dr. Wayne, house physician. How long have you known this patient, Doctor? A year or so. He's David Corvo. That's right. I don't like to interfere, Doctor. Go right ahead. When was Mr. Corvo operated on? 2 p.m. yesterday. That's about 16 hours ago. Yes. You were present during the surgery? I assisted Dr. Winslow. What surgery was done? Gallbladder removal. How is he? He'll be all right. Let it go too long, they usually do. I advised him six months ago. May I look at the chart? You're Dr. Sutton, aren't you? Yes. I thought I recognized you. Give Doctor the chart, Miss Elliot. The 
fever's up. This indicates an infection. Yes, went up at night. Had to do a lot of sewing inside. It may be a stitch infection. Penicillin ought to bring that temperature down a few hours. What's he getting? Saline solution intravenous. He's kind of weak, lost a lot of blood. Can't take food or water for two days. Just wet his lips a bit, Miss Carroll. Yes, Doctor. Might I ask the reason for these questions, Lieutenant? We're checking on Mr. Corvo's whereabouts. Mm -hmm. When? Between 9 and 10 o'clock last night. Guess you found out. Yes, guess we did. Thanks for the cooperation, Doctor. Glad to be of any help. Something wrong with it. There's something wrong about what we saw at that hospital. I know how you feel, Doctor. I've had theories blow up in my face kind of often. I'd forget about Corvo and get a lawyer for my wife if I were you. It's not a theory, Lieutenant. You'll hear facts. I didn't tell you half of them. I don't care how, when, or why, but it's Corvo. I put them in here myself. Miss Hall. Miss Hall, where are the Randolph recordings? I don't know, Doctor. You put them away yourself. The day you left for San Francisco. Yes, that's right. But they're not in here. Anybody besides you know the combination? Miss Hall and my wife. Your wife? Yes, she keeps her jewels in here. Did you open the safe while I was gone, Miss Hall? No, Doctor, I did not. How long have you worked for Dr. Sutton, Miss Hall? Six years. Oh, she couldn't have taken them, I know it. Try to remember. It's important. Did you move them? No, Doctor. Did you ever hear what was on those recordings? No, I never heard any of the recordings. Dr. Sutton ever tell you what was on them? No, Doctor never discusses his patients with me. You think I made it up? You think there are no recordings? I'm not lying, Lieutenant. You've got to believe me. Well, maybe they'll turn up. I'd like to see the rest of the house, Doctor, if you don't mind. Save me coming back. Handwriting, Doctor? Yes. Did you say that was meant for you? I don't know. I'll take it along. You better get yourself some sleep. I'll give you a ring if I turn up anything new. I'm Martin Avery, Dr. Sutton's lawyer. Lieutenant Colton. Bill, you know how I feel. Anne is like a sister to me. I've just seen her. I'm your friend as well as your lawyer, Bill. The situation may change, but right now... Well, it's bad, Bill, very bad. There's no use beating around the bush. Anne is not responsible. That's our only and best defense, insanity. The man Corvo drove her crazy. We can prove this, both medically and legally. Bill, I know what a shock it must be to have found out this thing about Anne. Yes, it's a shock if it's true. I'm afraid it is, Bill. Of course, there's several angles to it. That she may not be guilty of the actual murder. She may have seen Corvo do the thing and is trying to protect him difference. Or she may have been taking treatments from the man. The fellow's a hypnotist, among his other shady practices. He may have hypnotized her, given her a suggestion to kill the woman. Can't make anyone act on the hypnosis contrary to their strong religious or moral convictions. Unless she was jealous of the woman and hated her. And he used that. Yes, if she were jealous. Meaning she loved him.
sit down, Dr. Sutton. I'll try not to doze off if you want to talk to me, Dr. Sutton. My fever's down. Back to 101, I think. I give a lot for a sip of water. Please sit down. Easier for me to talk to you. Police still holding Anne? Yes. Stupid. Arresting an innocent woman. Medical chart meet with your approval, Dr. Sutton? You were in great pain last night. The notation of an oversensitive nurse. A few spasms. Does Anne know I'm here? I don't know. I meant to call her this morning until I read the papers. Rather, the nurse read them to me. My eyes aren't focusing yet. Typical police bungling the whole thing. Anne isn't guilty. What makes you certain? The motive, jealousy. Completely stupid. Anne wasn't jealous. Just a few days ago in my apartment, we discussed Terry Randolph thoroughly. My wife was never in your apartment. If you insist. What was said by you and my wife about Mrs. Randolph? Wherever it was said. I told Anne I was through with Terry, and she believed me. A man of experience always knows when a woman believes him. She was all over her jealousy. Sorry. It's hard to think. Full of drugs. I shouldn't have said that to you. Why not? Wrong to tell things to a husband. What are you telling me? Say it. Say it straight, Corvo. I didn't know one had to blueprint the facts of life for a great psychoanalyst. You're lying. You're not drugged, you're acting. You want me to think Anne loved you. You want me to believe that, don't you? Don't you, you cheap rat? Your bedside manner is a little odd, even for a psychoanalyst. Poor Anne, in jail, in real danger, and you bellowing with wounded vanity. If you can rid yourself of some of your husbandly egomania, maybe we can both help save her. What do you want? I'm Dr. Sutton. I was told Lieutenant Colton was here. You'll have to wait downstairs. Let him in, Andy. Nothing any of these, Lieutenant. Thought you'd be getting yourself some sleep, Doctor. Find anything? Nothing. Fingerprints all Corvos. A lot of correspondence, mostly bills. Hey, Lieutenant. Finally got a bite, Lieutenant. Looks like a woman's. Yeah. Index, middle finger, and thumb. All clear as rain. Looks like the lady was her, all right. Bring these to my office. Keep looking. Coming, Doctor. Sleep, Anne? I've uh, talked it over with Bill and we've decided on a line of procedure. We'll plead not guilty and not guilty by reason of insanity. Does Bill want me put away as a lunatic? Is that the procedure? Anne, we want to save you, Bill, as much as I. 
will prove that your relationship with this man, Corvo, unbalanced your reason temporarily and drove he you He had to... nothing to do with me. He didn't unbalance me or drive me to anything. Bill did. I don't think there's any point in my listening to this, Lieutenant. No, don't listen to it. Run away from the truth, as you have ever since you married me. You made me play act. I had to pretend I was healthy and happy when I was sick and miserable. Headaches, I couldn't sleep. Afraid to tell you. Afraid to lose your wonderful love. Locked away in the characterization of a serene and devoted wife. I imagine that's Mr. Corvo's diagnosis. Yes, and he helped me sleep. By making love to you. Well, I was never alone with him. You didn't visit his apartment? No, never. I refused. He asked me, but I didn't trust him. Why do you keep sticking to this story? And for your own sake, stop lying. I'm telling the truth. No, you're not. I've talked to him. I've been to his apartment. You were there. There's proof. You can't sit there and deny a love affair that's known to everyone. To the police, to me, to a hundred witnesses. You've made your choice. You don't want my help. I can't be of any more use here, Lieutenant. I'm sorry, Ann. He'll be back. No. He's gone. He hates me now. He doesn't hate you. He's exhausted and miserable. He was right. I've been lying to him. I can say it now because it doesn't matter. I'll never see him again. Would you care to make a new statement, Mrs. Sutton? I'm entitled to hear that privately first. Lieutenant. That's up to her. Privately? It doesn't matter. I've brought him such horrible troubles, and I... and I only wanted to love him. My husband's a very nice man. I don't think there are any nicer or kinder. Wasn't his fault. It was the way I am. I'm telling you all this because it... it has something to do with what happened to me. I'm a thief. What? I stole. What did you steal, Mrs. Sutton? I stole. It will be better if he divorces me. He must, for his sake. He can't be married to a thief. I did it before I stole. In school, when my father wouldn't let me spend money. And even after he died, he tied it all up in a trust fund. Thousands and thousands of dollars, but I could never have a new dress. Or have anything I wanted. That's how I fooled my father, by stealing. He didn't love me. He thought he did, but he didn't. Nobody ever caught me. I thought it was over when I left school and met Bill. I wanted to tell him. But I was afraid he couldn't love anybody who'd done that. I didn't tell him. It came back, because he was like my father. He treated me like my father did, and I had to do it again. I tried not to. I couldn't sleep and got a pain and had to do it again. I stole a pin from a store, the Wiltshire department store. He saw me. Who? Oh. Corvo. He helped me get away after they caught me. And that began your relation with Corporal. I've told it. Is there anything you wish to add, Mrs. Sutton? I take her back now. I don't know. She may be telling the truth. Or she may be laying a foundation for an insanity plea. She's telling the truth. And that gives us our first link in Corvo's hold over her. Blackmail. Quite a peculiar customer, this Corvo.
I'm Lieutenant Colton, Homicide Bureau. I saw you this morning, I think. Do you like talking? <sighs> Not much. I won't bother you too long, then. How'd you happen to meet Mrs. Sutton? I imagine she's told you. You tell me. We're checking with the Wilshire department store, so if it's true, you might as well tell me. It's true. You saw her steal a pin and helped her out. That's right, Lieutenant. I understand you had quite a talk with her husband this morning. Yes. Difficult conversation, but civilized. No blows struck. Told all, eh? Kind of let her down in a hurry. I'm a bit too adult to cover up for that kind of a woman. What kind is that, Mr. Corvo? The disloyal wife. Don't misunderstand me. Personally, I have nothing against women betraying their husbands. Even our government is against monopoly. Oh. I seem to have offended you. I take it from your unpoliceman-like blushes that you're a happily married man. I was. She died last month. Sorry. Gallbladder operation like yours. Only it didn't turn out so well. From a lot of angles. That operation of yours saved you a lot of trouble. In what way, Lieutenant? You'd have made a pretty good suspect. Better than poor Anne? Much. I'll talk it over with you sometime when you're feeling better. Just a minute. You've made a rather startling accusation, Lieutenant. It's not fair to leave on that. Well, we hear you extorted $60,000 from Mrs. Randolph. She was threatening to pull you into court to get it back. You beat up Mrs. Randolph, threatened to kill her if she exposed you as a tremor. She died just in time for you to miss that. May I ask who is responsible for these rather stupid rumors? Dr. Sutton. The husband of a woman who seems to be guilty of murder? At least, according to the police. Maybe he has evidence. You mean the recordings of Mrs. Randolph's analysis by Dr. Sutton? You know about that. Oh, it's one of the latest wrinkles in psychiatry. Wiretapping the subconscious. The babblings of an elderly siren being treated for mental disorders are hardly evidence. Even for a third degree, Lieutenant. That's why you're here. You've been listening to Mrs. Randolph accusing me from beyond the grave. Why not let me hear the recordings, Lieutenant? I think I'm entitled to know what else is in them, Lieutenant. I have a certain standing that might well be ruined, but... What else is in them, Lieutenant? I'll tell you some other time. I don't want to tie you now. Good night, Mr. Cole. I had to see you, Lieutenant. They told me you'd gone home. Going to turn in for a while. I'd advise you to go home and do the same. Oh, but this is important. All right. Come on in. Kind of empty in here. I usually go in the kitchen. This afternoon, after I walked out on Anne. I began to think. You know, it's curious when a husband can ignore eight years of devotion when a tiny suspicion flies into his heart. Yes, it's tough when it happens, Doc. But it didn't happen, Lieutenant. That's the first sane thought that's come to me since this thing started. A woman like Anne doesn't change suddenly. Some fingerprints and a few odd circumstances can't wipe out a woman's heart and character as if they'd never existed. It's hard for a man to believe that his wife... But I'm not believing it, Lieutenant. I've got the key to the whole thing now, and I want you to listen with an open mind. All right. We'll talk it over if you insist. 
I'll make some coffee. You saw me behave like a blind idiot this afternoon. I'm supposed to have a brain, a training, a science for helping people. And I've been sounding off like a subhuman, attacking a woman that's consciously never done a wrong thing. You've got to believe me. I'm listening. This morning, when we found the recordings gone from my office, I knew who had taken them. I couldn't bear to tell you, but I knew. Anne. No one else could have taken them. I didn't tell you because it meant she had stolen them to protect Corvo. Consciously stolen them for him. That's what I thought. All the more reason for thinking so now, Doctor. She's admitted being a thief. But that's the whole point. Avery told me what she'd said after I'd left. Her kleptomania. It's probably a neurosis from her childhood. I'm not sure before I talk to her, and it'll take time to straighten her out. But now that I know, well, I've got lots of time. Nothing but time as soon as she gets home. But getting home is something I wouldn't bank on too much, Doctor. He couldn't make a steal on the hypnosis unless she was already a thief. And that's how it happened. He made her steal the records and go to Mrs. Randolph's house under hypnosis and be found there with a the dead woman when the police came in. That would make a good line of defense if you could figure out who did the killing. Corvo. Wait a minute, Doctor. I've been willing to go along with you, but his alibi is solid. I tell you, it was Corvo. You're butting your head against a stone wall. I don't like him either, but he's accounted for. You saw him. He's not accounted for. His alibi stinks to high heaven. Here, I brought this out of my files for you. It's a UP story under a Hamburg dateline, December 10th, 1948. Absolutely authenticated. Dr. Theodore Herr, a surgeon, operated on himself under self-hypnosis. Removed his appendix in an operation that took four and a half hours. He got up off the operating table and went to work for the rest of the day. No pain, no shock. I can't go along with this, doctor. I'm sorry. I tell you, that's what happened. Corvo hypnotized himself and slipped out of the hospital at 8 o'clock and went off and killed Mrs. Randolph as he threatened to do. Then he came back. His fever was up to 104. The chart showed a sudden rise, remember? You're not helping your wife any with these loony theories, doctor. I happen to know what a gallbladder operation is like. Look, Lieutenant, I'd like one favor. Can't do people favors in a murder case. Anne can solve the case for you. Okay, I'll let her work on it tomorrow. The solution is hidden in her brain, and I can bring it out. Let me take her to Mrs. Randolph's house, where she was found. There, her memory can be awakened. That's enough theories for one night. I'm tired. But once she starts remembering, there's a good chance I can get her to retrace her movements. Tell us where she took the recordings. Tell us Corvo's orders given under hypnosis. It can be done, I tell you. Not by me. I have to do things my own way. Look, Lieutenant, this is a special case. My what wife just... Doctor. There's nothing special about your wife any more than anybody else that gets mixed up in a murder case. I've given you all the breaks I can. It means nothing to you what I've been saying. Not a thing. You won't take us there for one hour. No chance. I'm not going to make a fool of myself in this case, listening to a punchy psychoanalyst. I guess I'm the fool. Twice in one day. I can't expect you to see Anne with my eyes. She's my wife, not yours. Sorry to have bothered you. See you tomorrow. Daisy tells me the police were here this morning. It's a shame to bother you when you're so sick. That's the way the police are. Always walk right in. I knew Mrs. Randolph rather well. Yes, the girls were saying... What were the girls saying? There's a big news story in the papers this afternoon about the police suspecting somebody besides Mrs. Sutton. Who? They don't give any names, but it seems there are recordings of Mrs. Randolph's accusing somebody. They say these recordings would show who the real murderer was, no matter what alibi he has. And they're hunting all over town for them. Who's hunting? The police. They say that a new arrest will be made as soon as they find the recordings. There, I think you'll sleep tonight. In case you don't, Miss Carroll's on the floor. She has the pills. Tell her not to disturb me, please. Want your light out, Mr. Corvo? Yes, I just want to sleep. Good night, Mr. Corvo.
Colton talking. Who's this? Listen, Andy. Get Mrs. Sutton down to my office. I'll be there in 15 minutes. And what's Dr. Sutton's number? Analysis, Mrs. Teresa Randolph, 9th week, June 1st, 1949. I have so much to tell you, Dr. Sutton. I saw David. I'm glad you did. I faced it. Insisted on meeting me at the Green Star Motel. We used to meet there at the beginning. He thought. That's all right, Mrs. Randolph. I can imagine what he thought. He came in beaming, and he put his arms around me and started to make love to me. I said to him, David, stop that. You're ridiculous. He kept trying to kiss me. I laughed at him. He stood pouting like an idiot. I felt strong, doctor, and cleansed. I feel him out of my nerves, out of my skin. Even his voice it used to thrill me so. It sounded stupid. Did you tell him your plan? Yes, yes, I told him. I told him that he had until Monday, not one day longer. And then I was writing my daughter's guardian the full story. And, and going to my lawyer on Monday. And that I wasn't afraid to face what I'd done. Wouldn't you be more comfortable if you removed your hat, Mrs. Randolph? I can't. Why not? I'm so ashamed. I hoped I wouldn't have to tell you. But I will. He beat me. He hit my face. The hat hides the bruises. He beat me and he, he said he'd kill me before Monday unless I changed my mind. The motel owner really saved my life. He, Resisting me. You could tell me if you wanted to all that happened. I do want to. No. You've always had to hide the truth from me. Your mind does it by itself out of long habit. But, but you know the truth now. I'm not hiding anymore. I'm trying to remember. Anne. When did you first steal something? Please, tell me. In school. Several times. When you married me, I insisted that you start with me as a poor doctor's wife. That you don't spend your own money. That brought back the neurosis. My acting like your father made you steal again. You hate me. You can't love a thief. You're not a thief. You're someone I've injured by being blind. And I'll cure you, Anne. It might take some time. 
But if you'll trust me now. Oh, I will. I love you. I don't like to interrupt, Doctor, but I'm here as a police officer, not a chaperone. Your wife can't remember. We might as well call it off. She'll remember. Anne, you don't have to hide anything from me ever again. There's something in my mind that's stopping me from... Corvo gave you an order to forget. He placed it in your mind while you were under hypnosis. You're obeying his order. Don't obey him anymore, Anne. Yes. I remember. Fireplace. Log fell. I put it back. He made me come here. I remember. He must have made me do things. Horrible things. He made you do nothing horrible. <laughs> Darling, try to remember for me. I don't think it's going to work, Doctor. Yes. Wait. I remember. She was sitting here. Her head was hanging down. Touched her face. Before you came here, you went to my office. Do you remember that? Yes. I opened the safe. To take something out. The Randolph recordings. Where did you take them? I hid them. Where? I don't know. Yes, you do. Oh, Bill, I'm not lying. I'll never lie anymore to you. You'll never have to. I won't make you. I love you as you are. Bill, I, I put them away. Where? In a closet. In this house. When I came in, I remember I moved them from one hand to the other to open a door. Yes, that door. I put them in there. Bill, I... I'm frightened. You're tired. When we get home, we'll go away for a trip. Home. Nothing in here, Doctor. A lot of coats hanging, no sign of any records. They must be there. I put them on a shelf, under the shelf paper. I know she's telling the truth. They must be there. in one of the upstairs bedrooms. I can get away if you do that. Otherwise, I shall have to shoot. Please believe what I'm saying. And don't rely on my sanity. Send them upstairs. If I get away, no one will be killed. Man, the records are not in the closet. I want you to try remembering again. Your wife looks tired, Doctor. We can come back tomorrow. Her memory's working now. It'll work just as well in the morning. Yes, tomorrow. You promised me an hour, Lieutenant. If she can't tell us anymore, we'll search the house. We can begin with this room. Oh, Bill, I remember now. What? Upstairs. You took the recordings upstairs? Yes, to a bedroom. Are you certain? Yes, in, in a bedroom closet on the shelf. Have a look. Bill, I'm lying. I can't lie to you anymore, no matter what happens. They're not upstairs. Bill, he's here. He's hiding there. Corp. Now, hold your hand, Lieutenant. Shoot. Stand still. The records you're looking for are in a very natural place on the phonograph. I found them somewhat amusing. I didn't see him after this. They'll entertain you, I hope. But he telephoned me. During my departure. He woke me up in the middle of the night. He said, I'm not pretending, Terry. I will kill you if you force me to. And nobody will ever know who did it. Don't move. 
Then he denounced you, Dr. You're Sutton. bleeding to death, Corvo. Look. He said he hated you. And that you were responsible for everything. Stay there. And I said yes. You'd better let us help you. Yes, Dr. Sutton has given me Stand strength back. to live as a human being. You're too clever for this, Corvo. You know you can't get away. I'm trying, I've done many things too clever for you to understand. David Corvo, I've overlooked you. nothing. He's You'll evil, never make dangerous. it. I'm terrified. He'll I'm afraid you're right. He'll never know. He'll never pay. Tonight I was a bit stupid. <laughs> Mr. Sutton, over to your custody, Doctor. Emergency desk, please. Nice to have a wife come home to you. Hello, Lieutenant Colton speaking. Send an ambulance to 1400 Canyon Drive to pick up a body. Oh. 